welcome to the AVF podcast. Um, the Asia Ventilation Forum, or AVF, is a nonprofit organization made up of members from different Asian countries. We share our knowledge and experience in respiratory care and critical care with ICU workers across the continent with the aim of improving care and outcomes for the critically ill. I'm Jeff Paolo, your host tonight, an intensivist practicing in the Philippines. And with me today in this edition of the AVF ICU Behind the Scenes Stories is Dr. Andrew Lee, who is a respiratory physician and intensivist currently practicing in Singapore. Andrew is the lead author of the Epidemiology, Management, and Outcomes of Sepsis in ICUs Among Countries of Differing National Wealth Across Asia, also known as the Mosaics 2 study. This is a product of a large collaboration in the Asian Critical Care Tr Clinical Trials Group, and it was published this month in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. Um, Andrew, before we discuss uh, Mosaics 2, um, well, hello. And um, it's really nice to be able to finally meet you. We've been planning this for months already. Um, before we discuss the study itself, could you tell us more about the, the clinical trials group, the Asian, sure. Asian uh, Clinical Critical Care Trials Group? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. I, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I'm very privileged. Um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the Asian Critical Care Trial Group for the opportunity to actually conduct this study. Uh, it was uh, conceived in, I think, the year 2016-2017, where we um, decided that uh, Mosaic's one, which was conducted in 2010, uh, was getting a bit outdated. In, 20, in 2010, when they did Mosaic's uh, one, they were thinking about the perspective of uh, how um, sepsis was treated in the Asian uh, ICUs. At the point in time, I think um, the results for compliance to sepsis bundles uh, at the point in time, it's actually the six hours uh, sepsis bundles were a little bit um, concerning. And I think over time with education, with uh, progress in our uh, and advancement in what we, we know, uh, and the publications of multiple sepsis guidelines thereafter, I think we wanted to see how we did. And I thought we, it, took, it was an opportunistic uh, time to actually uh, conduct this trial. I think also with the fact that uh, EPIC-3, uh, uh, conducted by uh, Prof. Jean-Louis Vincent, uh, actually came out around, uh, I think about a year plus uh, later to talk about uh, the age, uh, talk about uh, sepsis in, uh, sorry, infection actually in, uh, in the country worldwide. And I think that importantly, it, um, this gave us an opportunity to collaborate with uh, our neighboring uh, re uh, partners in the various parts of the region. And I think we are extremely, extremely grateful for that. So uh, how we did, so how this uh, trial came about was uh, using, looking at these two perspectives. And I think in point of time, the sepsis guidelines, sepsis tree guidelines actually just got published. And we found that actually most, or if not all studies at the point of time, had not been able to conduct studies using the sepsis tree definition. And I thought this was a, a very opportunistic uh, time to actually do that. And hence, uh, that's how the idea uh, came to being. And I think I was very grateful to uh, my mentor, actually, uh, Jason, who actually allowed me to have the liberty and allowed me to have the freedom to uh, be able to conceive the idea to try to figure out uh, what are the intents and how to actually go about conducting this large uh, multinational study among the Asian countries. And I think it was the last uh, or one of the last large studies done on sepsis that came before the pandemic. Uh, so yes, that's right. Everything, everything post um, twenty twenty would be a different, um, basically sepsis is colored a lot by COVID nineteen now. Oh, absolutely. Yes, that's right. Um, you were speaking about um, mosaics one. If we can go back towards mosaics one sure. before we go to mosaics two, mm -hmm. you were saying that there were some concerning findings about um, our our Asian. ICU's ability to actually take um, follow the, the bundles of care at that time. And they were, you mentioned they were the 6R bundles. Yes, um, mm -hmm. yes please. Um, please. So at the point in time, I think Mosaic's one uh, was, I think, the first large, uh, largest Asian study about sepsis uh, management. And I think uh, it showed that our compliance to the 6-hour sepsis bundle was about 10% or less. And, yeah, uh, I so think that, it was the, at best it was 10% and some, right. some group were doing like three or something. 
That's right. And I think at that point of time, we were already talking about just purely the six-hour bundle. So imagine that over time, our sepsis guidelines, uh, surviving sepsis actually has advocated three-hour bundles, subsequently even the one-hour bundle. So that gave rise to, um, maybe not concerns, but I think gave rise to a question of, have we improved ever since we have educated ourselves and learned that we have uh, not uh, been doing as well as what we expected to be? And I think I'm very thankful that um, this study actually gave the opportunity to showcase how we have improved as uh, Asian countries. So could you uh, let us know a little bit about the, um, the key takeaways that we had from Mosaics 2? Sure. So uh, for Mosaics 2, uh, basically, I think we maybe I'll break it down to two parts. Uh, the first part we were looking at was about the outcomes of uh, sepsis bundles and our sepsis bundle compliance. So. Uh, we know that the sepsis uh, one-hour bundle was uh, fraught with controversy uh, for a multitude of reasons, including antibiotic misuse, so on and so forth. And so we wanted to establish uh, whether the sepsis bundle, uh, whether giving antibiotics, completing the sepsis bundle within one hour was really something uh, crucial in the outcomes of uh, patients with sepsis. And of course, using the sepsis definition, uh, the sepsis tree definition uh, in this study. And I think we found that uh, three hours rather than one, uh, as compared to not giving any antibiotics, uh, resulted in uh, improved mortality. Anything beyond uh, three hours, there was actually uh, worse outcomes. So I think that was the first message uh, that we that came across with the Mosaics 2 study. And I am pleased to say that actually we improved significantly up to, uh, I think if I'm very correct, a rate of 50 odd percent uh, in terms of uh, sepsis bundle compliance. And interestingly, this is in countries that are in the lower, the middle income countries as compared to the upper middle income countries. So that's something uh, of quite some of interest actually, because it's a counterintuitive to be very honest. And I guess um, that also speaks to the, um, to the success of the the educational impact uh, and the educational impact of everyone talking about uh, sepsis now. Yes, yes. So I, I think we are very grateful and I think we show that uh, despite the challenges that we face both even in the low to low middle income countries, um, our education efforts probably seems to have uh, had some impact, I, I believe. And I think also because people are not recognizing the need for early antibiotics. So uh, that has been something that's very prominent uh, in, in this study itself. There is an interesting finding that, that you um, put in the discussion regarding the, um, was it right, the higher income countries were weirdly slower to give the antibiotics than some of the um, lower or medium income countries. Did I get that right? Uh, that's correct. And um, there, is a, there is a pretty good explanation for that. Um, I don't remember though. Okay, um, so I think one of the uh, one of the reasons why we speculate that uh, this happens because if you look at the strata and the type of patients that actually come in and where the patients come from, the large majority of the patients uh, with sepsis that uh, enters the ICU from in the lower middle income countries are actually from the ED, where your mm. focus is basically resuscitating, administering life saving treatment, and uh, and thereafter uh, moving forward. So I I believe that that's one big reason why uh, that has actually allowed the low to low middle income countries actually to improve in their, uh, sepsis, uh, in their sepsis bundle compliance. So that's one big reason. Of course, I think uh, uh, importantly that, uh, like I emphasized earlier, uh, when this happened, uh, this also, uh, also gave us the understanding because in the low to low middle income countries, the severity and the complexity of the patients are probably a little bit less compared to the upper the upper uh, and the high income countries. So I think from that perspective, that also um, probably gave rise to say that, okay, we need to give antibiotics, but we had to consider so many different other things. And that may uh, result in perhaps a, a delayed uh, administration of the antibiotics and uh, completion of the blood cultures and so forth. Well, one of the other interesting things that I saw or I remember from the mosaics too was that we were, we were thinking of um, doing this study so that we could characterize more about the tropical diseases impacting our 
management or outcomes of sepsis. And weirdly, we were only seeing like 3% um, of the whole population of sepsis patients in at least the hospitals we were looking at had these things like dengue and um, the other tropical diseases. Um, how did you feel about that, that, okay. that finding? Uh, I, I would like to address uh, Jeb's uh, question here. I think it's a very valid, relevant question because it's a stark contrast to what we expect it to be. I think there are three main reasons. The first reason is that with seasonal variation, sometimes we may uh, it may be underrepresented as this is a four-day point prevalence study uh, that was taken on each day, one day per season. The second mm -hmm. is that uh, most of the ICUs that participated in this study were actually from urban areas, which is very reflective of what... Uh, the ICUs are supposed to be in Asia when uh, in a study in critical care medicine by uh, Jason Paul and colleagues. So uh, as all these tropical diseases are usually in the rural areas, so there may be limited access to the ICU. And as a consequence, that's why it's underrepresented in the ICU burden. The third is that some people may consider that we may be under detecting uh, these uh, conditions purely because we may not have adequate microbiological support. But this is actually not true. In the study, uh, in this study, where we looked at every where every patient was admitted, we actually looked at the capabilities of the ICUs where these patients were admitted. And I'm pleased to say that actually almost 90%, or in fact more than 90%, were able to uh, have adequate microbiological support to detect TB, to detect malaria, and I think up to 70 odd percent could, could detect uh, dengue. I think that um we, we now know what to do for Mosaics 3, right? Yes. Going to widen the reach. Yes, that's right. So regarding the um, epidemiology of sepsis in Asia, I mean, what did, what did we find in Mosaics 2? Yeah, so I think uh, apart from the very interesting finding about tropical diseases, um, I think we are actually not very far, much different uh, from most of the world. So EPIC 3 was actually conducted... Uh, among uh, multiple countries, but looking at infection, okay? Mm -hmm. Whereas for us, our population is a bit different. We looked at all patients with sepsis. And actually, we find um, this, regardless of our definition, actually, the, out, the, the, the epidemiological findings are actually relatively similar. Gram-negative uh, gram bacteria is predominated. Um, whether it's a Klebsiella versus whether it's uh, E. coli, uh, that one, I think, uh, plays, uh, will change in terms of uh, order of, of uh, in prevalence. Um, I think, uh, but what, uh, as what we expected, when we compared the, pre the prevalence of diseases, or rather prevalence of sepsis and the type of uh, sepsis that were pre uh, present in the different seasons, um, we know that sepsis prevalence was a lot higher among the, uh, during the winter season and predominantly because of a viral infections flu. This could also be because um, there was an increased uptake simply because we suspected it, so everyone did PCRs. So um, I, I do want to acknowledge that this is a this this is a point prevalence study, so there can be some uh, biasness that we also have to watch. But I think it is consistent with most of uh, other studies that we've seen, both from Europe, uh, Europe and in America, where actually during the winter seasons they actually tend to be uh, uh there's more sepsis predominantly due to uh, viral infections. Yep. Then I think uh, if you ask me about the uh, the type of patients, I thought, interestingly, the type of patients did matter. And uh, we know that uh, in maybe I was focused a bit on the lower uh, middle-income countries because this, I think, is the first study that actually um, really looked at a large number of lower middle-income countries and compared to the upper middle and the high-income country patients. So they tend to be less sick, I think, as expected. And most of them actually come from ED. I think this is the first time we probably have proven that because we actually had over a thousand odd patients from the low to low middle income countries. And um, we also do, like I said, I think uh, we also do see that the comorbidities uh, are a lot more complex among the upper middle to high income countries, uh, which is not unexpected. Yeah, so I think it's a, uh, we are just reiterating and re-emphasizing the point that has been seen in EPIC 3 and in EPIC 2 to that um, uh, gram-negative rods are something that we do need to look out for, and probably that's where the, the choice of empirical antibiotics do matter. So I hope that with our study, it gives us a glimpse of what are the type of empirical antibiotics that we should be initiating. Thank you.
because of the, the, the one of the major findings, which is basically that it was mainly the antibiotic therapy that was the most important within the first three hours. Mm -hmm. um, I especially like that recommendation where there would be a nuanced approach to to the other parts of the bundles, depending on the resource levels of the hospitals that are taking care of these patients. And I'm sure many of our colleagues here in Asia would want to explore that. So I hope that um, at least this discussion can spark off some other conversations among, among their own teams um, later on. Now, um, because this was a large study and we were talking to, you were talking to a lot of people all over Asia um, and you know, Asia is the biggest continent in the world, many, many countries, most people uh, live over here. What do you think um, are some useful lessons as a researcher from your experience in this critical care research, um, especially when you're talking with people, well, all over Asia and also with different levels of resource? Okay. Um, I think this is an uh, extremely important question because uh, as we go uh, as in the decade ahead, I believe this is something that all of us will want to actually delve into. Uh, first of all, I think um, my thanks and gratitude to Jason, uh, Jeb and team from Asian Critical Care uh, Trials Group because they gave me the opportunity and the doors to actually open to talk to people to be able to collaborate and do this study. Um, I think I faced a couple of challenges and I would like to name, uh, name them. Uh, firstly, I think in terms of uh, resources, um, we know that the low to low middle income countries tend to have greater difficulty collecting data purely because either they are, they are so busy with clinical work that they don't have time to do so. Two, language barriers are a real thing. And I think three, the, um, because the dedication to actually do this is uh, so uh, maybe something that is out of their comfort zone, uh, it does take a lot of engagement to actually convince them to actually try to do so. So I can't do this without the help of my various uh, national partners who, who are uh, there to support and provide uh, uh, guidance to actually each of the uh, each of the participating sites. We had a total of 386 ICUs uh, from varying countries, uh, China, uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Bangladesh, India, and the and the ability to be able to connect them in one single common language was something that uh, at start state uh, I realized that that was not possible. So I actually had to sit down and come up with different translations for the questionnaire so that it's validated and be able to uh, answer the questions carefully. So the second lesson with that, the second lesson comes is that the questions must be straightforward. It cannot be complex. So mm. it should usually as far as possible be a simple yes or no or a multiple choice question because anything more uh, can, uh, while it's straightforward, but it taxes the 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 folks around the region, especially those who are less inclined into research. And these are the very people whom we are trying to reach out to. So I think we have to take that into consideration. The third is that technology plays a big part. I think there are quite a few countries that uh, most countries actually are happy with uh, going online to do it. And especially in this day and age with teleconsults, with, uh, I mean, uh, with, uh, with COVID happening, I think this has become more and more the norm. But you'll be surprised that actually certain countries still do not use that. In fact, actually, during my study, I actually had uh, people sending me hard mail over uh, uh, over a course of uh, the entire study for all their results, and then we had to transcribe it in. So I think we have there to was, be prepared for for such sending you mail. Yes, I, oh, I had wow. at least uh, two countries who did that. Okay, so um, air air um air mail still um, yes, air exists. Mail. Yes, exactly. So I think that was a, a very stark lesson to me uh, about the differences between uh, countries that are well-resourced versus areas that want to contribute, but also uh, have limited resources. And I think it's something that we need to uh, be mindful of. I think the fourth lesson that uh, I, I learned from this is actually the need to constantly communicate. Um, so I I know that this is a cliche statement. And I think most people will say that, okay, all, all studies need to constantly communicate. But I think um, there needs to be a bit of greater effort in engagement with the, uh, with the, with 
units that are in uh, that are more resource constrained because without constant encouragement and constant reminders, sometimes they would just forget in the midst of things. And so uh, there was this constant back and forth uh, role um, even at the stage where after all the data is collected, we're trying to verify and try again to fill up the missing data. Uh, data uh, it, it really was a big back and forth uh, thing. So maybe to synergize and make it easier, one of the things that I can imagine doing is that um, the, the, the central control person uh, or the person or basically the, 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 the person who's actually uh, helming the study in that country, okay, uh, must be uh ma we must have good communication with them and constantly feedback of where are the areas that are often missing because they are the very people who will be able to engage their own community to be able to get back the answers to us. Now I can engage, but because I'm uh, a person from a foreign land, they may not um they may listen and say okay that's it. But I think when people from their country when they do it, these are people who are well respected, people who ask them to join the study, and they would bend over back more often than not to actually try to get things done. So I think for that perspective, a good national coordinator is crucial in these studies. Wow. That was a lot. Um, now I was thinking, I just um, listening to you speak about um, how it was conducted. You, this kind of study um, done by a generally, I mean, a young researcher such as yourself, would be very inspiring to a lot of people who might want to be starting their own um, careers or their own um, or, or forward their own ideas when it comes to research. Mm. Um, what was your favorite part of doing this large study? I have two. I think oh, the first right. was actually uh, conceptualizing it. I, I, I think the, uh, the, the ability to be able to conceptualize how you want to do it with the feedback from seniors and constructive criticism to make it a tighter and a more deliberate sort of a proposal uh, to me was the one part that I enjoyed tremendously because it came, it's like uh, giving birth to a baby or giving birth to the, the fruition of the, uh, of the actual proposal. The second part that I, I really quite enjoyed uh, was uh, the ability to uh, connect with uh, the various parties in different countries. It gave me the opportunity to uh, learn about them, to hear their concerns, to hear how they struggle. And I think it gave me the, the, the opportunity and room to be able to uh, see how best we can help. And thereby, I think we build up friendships. And I think the friends that I've made along the way in this uh, journey was, I think, something that uh, I'll hold to uh, all the days of my life. Thank you. Uh, and um, I guess my last question would be the the opposite of that. What what thing or what parts of it do you think we we could have done better at? Okay, uh, I can think of two. Uh, the first is that um, uh, is regards to the data. The I think the data collection form. Um, I having the hindsight that I have now and the perspective, I may have wanted to make it a bit simpler because I do know that um, when we first started collecting the data, uh, I realized that uh, some people could have misinterpreted the way it was done. So there was a bit of back and forth. Uh, we had to explain, ask. Um, the second uh, thing that I felt that uh, I could have improved on is actually how to how to uh, be sensitive uh, sensitive to the, 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 the nuances that different countries and different regions do have. Because I know that in the course of uh, this study, uh, I also learned and encountered the different cultures and how people approach things. So perhaps that, I won't say that is a, I won't say that it was a mistake, but I think it was a learning journey to know how people react so that I know how to better uh, pitch the situation and uh, pitch the, the idea to them such that they will be able to accept it more readily. Well, uh, we will be looking forward, therefore, to, um, you know, the sepsis guidelines have changed several times again since we yes. published um, or we, since we started work on mosaics too. Um, and then the pandemic had happened. 
and I think a lot more people um, got more, um, I think the, the idea of critical care became um, more real or more in your face yes, for many right. people because of Absolutely. the pandemic. So uh, a lot of more people might be interested in joining these kinds of studies again later. So I guess um, it's time to um, go back to the drawing board and conceptualize uh, Mosaics 3. Oh, yes, I, I absolutely uh, agree with you uh, on that. I do hope that uh, more people will collaborate, especially uh, from our neighboring countries. Uh, and I think as far as possible, um, we want to uh, collaborate and be a collaborative environment, actually, because I think we can do it as uh, Asians together. Do you have any other final messages for our listeners tonight? I think my main message would be um, that uh, regardless of what I what we have done, I think we have to go back and thank um, each and every single partner who did this. And I think collaboration remains key through all these uh, multi-centered, multinational studies. I would have not been able to do it without them. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Andrew. It was um, very lovely to meet you, finally. Um, just a disclosure, I was actually the Philippine um, representative for, um, for Mosaics too. So, but this is the first time that um, I have actually met Andrew and been able to speak with him um, beyond email. So um, thank you very much for listening. Um, this, is, uh, this has been the um, beyond, uh, sorry, the behind the scenes um, ABF podcast and um, Everything that we have talked about here, the studies will be um, posted um, in the descriptions of both the YouTube and the Spotify channels. And um, we will see you again for the next edition of the AVF podcast. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Good night, everyone.